Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Thank you for joining us. And here's a look at some of the stories we have coming up for you today. Today, the nation's highest court took up challenges to Biden's vaccine and testing mandates. The stakes are high. If they decide to allow Biden's mandate to stay in place, companies will face consequences in the next month. We bring you an analysis of what's at stake and how the court is expected to rule. And a judge has ruled in favor of 35 Navy SEALs. The SEALs were facing termination from the Pentagon for taking a pass on the vaccine due to their sincerely held religious beliefs. We'll chat with one of the attorneys representing the SEALs in their case. The unemployment rate fell to 3.9% in December. President Biden touted the nation's historic unemployment numbers despite a mixed report on the U.S. jobs market. Today, the nation's highest court took up challenges to Biden's vaccine and testing mandates. The justices are pressed for the question of whether to temporarily block the mandates or hold them in place. And if the justices do choose to allow the mandates, companies will face fines as early as February. NTD's Melina Wisecup brings us more. Justices heard challenges over two of Biden's vaccine and testing mandates. The first mandate applies to health care workers across the nation. It essentially requires health care providers to have their workers vaccinated or face Medicaid and Medicare funding being pulled from them. The second challenge is over Biden's vaccine or testing mandate that applies to private businesses, and this impacts over 100 million U.S. workers. And for these rulings, the stakes are high. You know, when we put these very strict requirements on at a federal level, we're really tying the hands uh, and having consequences downstream on the ground that's leading to massive staffing shortages, uh, that's shutting down the economy. And I think I think it's very tough territory. OSHA, the federal agency that would enforce the vaccine or testing mandate, argued to the justices that it's their responsibility to keep workers safe. So the mandate is needed. The secretary here cited overwhelming scientific and medical evidence that the grave danger exists based on how this virus is transmitted anywhere people gather indoors together. And that applies to a lot of workplaces, but that just turns on the nature of how this virus is communicable between people. She also notes that it's not a vaccine mandate since companies can opt out for a regular testing option instead. But the other side argues that it's not a matter of if companies should take steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It's whether a federal agency can impose those kinds of requirements. They're trying to set a blanket wide economy wide policy by an emergency rule. OSHA does not have that power. Thank you. The two dozen states and multiple businesses in the suit argue the decision should be left up to the states. An attorney in the healthcare industry tells us he sympathizes with local control, especially in the politics of today. Um, and we're, in, I think, in a moment of time where the country is deeply polarized, that it's not a terrible thing for there to be variation and, and flexibility for different states to take different approaches. I think a lot of the challenge here is that we've moved so quickly uh, at every step, and 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 I think the more that the, there's time taken uh, to to reflect and make sure that we're doing the right thing. We'll find the right balance. Some justices also pondered whether this mandate opens the door to letting OSHA impose other medical requirements on employees in the future. The justices mostly seemed skeptical of Biden's mandate on private businesses. But it may be a close call for Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett. And it's not a black and white question. Um, and I think that I think they take their work seriously. And I think they are going to be concerned about, you know, taking too, um, you know, taking taking too uh, streamlined or simplified of an approach. Melina, this was an emergency hearing brought to the Supreme Court today. Uh, when can we expect to have a final ruling on these vaccine and testing mandates? Steve, the court is really under a lot of pressure to act quickly here, considering the deadline for those private businesses to implement the mandates is this coming Monday. And considering the scope and complexity of the arguments presented here today, it's unlikely that the justices will have an official ruling by then, but they could. Now, it's also important to note that this is just the start of this uphill battle. Even if the court does rule to block Biden's mandate, it's only a temporary block, and the justices will have to take up these arguments again in the future. Now, if the court does choose to uphold Biden's mandates, non-complying businesses will start to see fines as early as February. Steve? Thanks, Melina. 
A federal appeals court Wednesday upheld the decision to block vaccine mandates for federal contractors in three states. The Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals upheld a previous injunction blocking the mandate for Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. The Biden administration mandates federal workers and contractors to take the vaccine. The administration also requires workers at companies with over 100 employees to get the shot or get weekly testing. A group of Navy SEALs have been battling for the right to an exemption to the COVID-19 vaccine mandate on religious grounds. And a judge in the case has just handed down some positive news to the Navy SEALs. We have one of the attorneys representing the SEALs with us to discuss. Jeremy Dice, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Your legal organization, First Liberty Institute, represented 35 Navy SEALs in a recent suit where the judge ruled in favor of their right to a religious accommodation to the COVID-19 vaccine. This sounds like a pretty major victory. It's huge. It's a great precedent that will, I, I think, confirm the, the uh, religious rights of our men and women in the armed forces. Judge Reed O'Connor, the federal district court judge in Fort Worth, who wrote that opinion, pointed out that there is no First Amendment exception. I'm sorry, there is no COVID-19 exception to the First Amendment. And there's no military exclusion to the Constitution. And what he found in this preliminary injunction is that the Navy is simply rubber stamping denials of anyone who, issue, who asks for a religious accommodation. And they're granting all kinds of medical and administrative uh, accommodation requests here. So the Navy has engaged in some severe religious discrimination that they need to correct. I hope it would be final. It's a preliminary injunction right now, which means that it actually stays everything and enjoins the Navy right now while the case continues. Uh, but the Navy has the opportunity to, to say, OK, we give. We understand that this is a problem. We're going to fix it. Uh, but uh, they may also choose to appeal it to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And from there, of course, we could go to the Supreme Court. We're more than happy to defend the right of these Navy sailors, these, uh, these, these SEALs, as they continue on their way to protect our religious freedom. And none of them should be put to the choice of choosing between their faith and service to their country. There have been reports that religious exemptions were not even considered and in many cases just essentially automatically rejected. What have you heard in this regard? Well, that, that was uh, articulated in Judge O'Connor's opinion. There's about a 50-step process that the military goes through to evaluate a request for religious accommodation. The very first step is to create a template that denies the religious accommodation. And that ultimately goes up to about step 35, where, the, where a uh, head on show somewhere in the Pentagon signs off on the, religious, the denial of the religious accommodation. All of our Navy sailors who have received that, that uh, denial have the exact same form letter that is sent to them, except for the change in rank and their name at the top of the whole thing. And that, Judge O'Connor said, is evidence that the Navy has no intent of considering the very particular issues that are raised by these sailors. And that's what the Navy is required to do. They have to take these things on a case-by-case, -case, individualized basis, but they're rubber stamping denials instead. Meanwhile, hundreds, maybe thousands, are receiving secular exemptions to the COVID-19 shot, whether that's for medical or administrative reasons. And so the, the judge was left to conclude that the Navy's engaged in a religious discrimination in violation of both the law and the Constitution. What has the response been like from the SEALs that your organization is representing? Well, they're thrilled by this, obviously, and many of them, and look, we're talking about guys who are the Olympic athletes of the, the warriors on this planet, right? They're, they've got something like 300 years of combined combat experience uh, among all of them. They love their job, and they love to put their life on the line to preserve our freedoms. I think it's remarkable that these guys who have gone into foreign environments and risked life, limb, and everything else to protect our civil liberties are now willing to stand in a courtroom to defend our civil rights and our religious liberties as well. So they're thrilled that the Navy has been enjoined right now, and they're hopeful that this will mark a, not only a dramatic change for the Navy for them, but also provide a roadmap for their brothers in arms across the armed forces to use to, to secure their religious liberty as well. Jeremy Dice, thank you. Thanks for having me. The U.S. Navy has just recently announced that it discharged 20 sailors for refusing to receive the COVID vaccine, while the Marine Corps confirmed that 251 Marines have been discharged. The Labor Department said Friday that the unemployment rate fell from 4.2 percent in November to 3.9 percent in December, but employers added only 199,000 jobs, the worst month of 2021. It's also much lower than what economists had projected.
Uh, expectation was we were forecasting a 440,000 rise in non-farm payrolls. Uh, so when it came in at 199, I was very surprised thinking, well, gee, it's deja vu all over again because the November number was expected to be strong and it came in at about half of what had been projected. Um, yet the unemployment rate, which we thought would stay at 4.2%, then came in substantially lower. So um, a surprise on both counts. The Labor Department's report comes as businesses are struggling to fill jobs, with many Americans remaining reluctant to return to the workforce. Still, Friday's date reflected only the job market in early December before the spike in COVID-19 infections began to disrupt the economy. Economists have cautioned that job growth may slow in January and February due to the spike in Omicron infections. Friday, President Joe Biden boasted about the record drop in unemployment in December and the job growth over the past 12 months. He credited to his economic plan. There's been a lot of press coverage about people quitting their jobs. Well, today's report tells you why. Americans are moving up to better jobs, with better pay, with better benefits. That's why they're quitting their jobs. This is the kind of recovery I promised and hoped for for the American people. Biden said it represented the sharpest one-year drop in unemployment in U.S. history, but job growth was only about half of what economists had predicted. Overall, the U.S. economy added 6.4 million jobs last year as the pandemic continues to strain the recovery. The president also touted his Build Back Better plan and criticized the GOP for voting against it. Right now, the bill is still being stalled due to opposition from Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. The Biden administration is distributing an additional $4.5 billion in funds to help low-income people cover their heating costs throughout the winter, with cold-weather states receiving the largest share. Friday, the White House released a state-by-state -state breakdown of the funding being distributed now. Minnesota received nearly $274 million in home energy assistance for needy residents. Meanwhile, Texas, which has a population five times larger, received just 10 million more. New York State, with a population of less than 20 million people, compared with Texas's 29 million, received just under $876 million. Congressman Ken Buck joins us to discuss the challenges big tech poses to our society, and he also weighs in on China and the upcoming Beijing Olympics. Top officials from the US and Japan are boosting cooperation on defense and research that's in light of China's growing aggressiveness in the disputed waters. One year after the January 6th Capitol breach, and the FBI is still searching for the person who left two pipe bombs outside the Republican and Democratic National Committee buildings. Hello and welcome back to NCD's Capital Report. Here to discuss the challenge big tech poses to our nation, we're happy to have Colorado Congressman Ken Buck with us. Congressman Ken Buck, thank you so much for joining us on the Capital Report. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Congressman, I wanna to talk to you about big tech in their recent purge of more voices they don't agree with. You have a member of Congress, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Dr. Robert Malone, uh, one of the inventors of the mRNA vaccines. Where does this all end and how concerned are you? Well, I'm very concerned uh, to start with. I think the, the really the critical uh, piece here is how we deal with what some perceive to be misinformation. Uh, in a free society, the best way to uh, address false information is with accurate information and, and a lot of accurate information. And when you censor uh, someone because you believe their information is false or you don't like what they say, you end up in a situation where uh, people become more skeptical about what the truth is. And so um, obviously in China, Russian totalitarian regimes, uh, they censor all the time to cover up the truth. In a free society, we have the tools to expose the truth and to educate people about the truth and censoring, whether it's done by the government or a private company, 
is a mistake, a serious mistake. Congressman, outside of banning political rivals and dissenting voices, what are some of the other things that concern you about these big tech corporations? So the reason they can censor and the reason they uh, really dominate in so many areas is because they're monopolies. My answer is that we have a, a group of competitors. We create by leveling the playing field uh, competition in the marketplace so that the, uh, the, the Facebook marketplace looks a lot more like the cable news marketplace or it looks a lot more like the newspaper marketplace. Now, Congressman, you've been working on multiple antitrust bills to limit the monopoly power of Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook. What is the real solution to address these big tech companies? Uh, we, we've seen so much. 94% of desktop searches are on, on Google, and we need to make sure that people understand that there are other options available, and they also understand exactly what Google is doing. Uh, Google has uh, uh, your uh, geolocation capabilities, so they know where you are. They uh, have a history of your searches, and so they know what you're interested in. And they can match up all the different types of information they have. And it's a very lucrative business for them to sell that information to third parties uh, to advertise. Now, the part of the answer is your digital file is yours. And if you want to take that digital file and move to a different uh, search company, that's your right. It's not Google's uh, uh, information. Um, and so we need to make sure that we have what we call portability, just like you can take a, uh, your contacts from one cell phone company and move them to a different cell phone company. You can move your cell phone number. We need to make sure that we have the same situation with uh, searches. Now, last year, you became the head of the Freedom from Big Tech Caucus. You said uh, big tech companies rig the free market, crush competitors, stifle innovation, and cozy up to China and censor Americans. Uh, for the record, Microsoft, Cisco, and others <clears throat> excuse me, have helped to contribute to China's great firewall over the years. How serious of an issue do you think this is? I think it's a very serious issue. I think when you see uh, Apple, for example, the, the protesters in Hong Kong had an app that allowed them to determine where the uh, police were and where they were cracking down on the protesters. And the protesters could communicate with each other on this app. And China contacted Apple and asked Apple, or told Apple to take the app off of the App Store. And uh, Apple did that. And when they did that, uh, the protesters were at risk. And, and they were at risk for a totalitarian regime to crack down on free speech, on protesting something that uh, in this country we would consider vital to our democracy. So it's, I, I think it's really important that we recognize just how, uh, how compromised these companies are when they deal with foreign governments and, and try to enter foreign marketplaces. Now, Congressman, before I let you go, I, I just have to ask, with the Beijing Olympics approaching and the Biden administration's um, call for a diplomatic boycott, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that that was enough to hold uh, China accountable for its human rights abuses? No, of course not. Uh, the, what we need to do is we, we need to really reset the uh, clock with China. We need to make sure that we are... Uh, doing everything we can. And, and we, what we have to do is we have to create an alliance around the world with uh, the European Union and, and Great Britain and, and so many other countries to uh, hold China. Make, you know, at, at one point it was uh, everyone looked the other way. All countries looked the other way when they were cheating. They're now a, a major economy and it's no longer acceptable to look the other way as they cheat and steal intellectual property and, uh, and manipulate their currency and, and really uh, in, engage in the world economy in an unfair way. So I, I think that uh, the Olympics shouldn't necessarily be the, uh, you don't punish athletes to, to make political decisions all the time because there'll be recriminations down the road. But what we need to do is really work with our allies to uh, develop an, an economic sanction that is meaningful towards China. Congressman Ken Buck, thank you. Thank you. Former President Trump's social network now has a release date of February 21st. The Truth Social app is now available for pre-order on the App Store. And the U.S.-Japan virtual conference kicked off on Thursday. Two major steps will lead to deeper defense ties between Washington and Tokyo. 
That's amid mounting aggression from China and increasing tensions over Taiwan. Good evening and good morning. Addressing the virtual meeting, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the allies will sign two major agreements. Together, they'll work to bolster U.S.-Japan cooperation in defense. We'll sign a new five-year host nation support framework that will invest greater resources to deepen our military readiness and interoperability. This framework will cover the continued housing of U.S. troops in Japan. There will also be further collaboration in the field of military research. And we're launching a new research and development agreement that will make it easier for our scientists, for our engineers, and program managers to collaborate on emerging defense-related issues, from countering hypersonic threats to advancing space-based capabilities. He cited North Korea's launch of a hypersonic missile earlier this week. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, still recovering from a COVID-19 infection, joined the meeting from home. We know how strong that alliance is today. It remains the cornerstone of peace and prosperity in the region. And we're rightly proud that it's built upon a foundation of not just common interests, but also shared values. Prior to the Thursday meeting, Japan signed a security pact with Australia. The move was seen as a response to China's increasing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. A Chinese national pleaded guilty on Thursday in Missouri federal court to conspiring to steal trade secrets from agricultural company Monsanto to benefit the Chinese communist regime. Shanghai Tao, who was employed by Monsanto from 2008 to 2017, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit economic espionage and is scheduled to be sentenced on April 7th. He faces a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. Federal officials found Sheng in possession of copies of a proprietary predictive algorithm developed by Monsanto as he was waiting to board a flight to China in June of 2017. He was allowed to fly to China where he worked for the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Soil Science. According to the Department of Justice, he was arrested when he returned to the United States. One year after the January 6th Capitol breach, and the FBI is still searching for the person who left two explosives outside of the offices of the Republican and Democratic National Committees. Investigators have spoken to over 900 people, collected 39,000 video files, and examined more than 400 leads in the search for the suspect but they're still no closer to finding the suspect's identity and are hoping renewed attention on the video of the person may spark a tip to crack the case. The U.S. Department of Agriculture announced a $750 million increase in school meal funding. Up to $1.5 billion had been provided in December by the Biden administration to help school meal programs deal with the challenges brought on by the pandemic. The funding is intended to keep federal reimbursements on pace with food and operational costs due to the supply chain demands. About $500 million is planned for the purchase of domestic goods and American-grown food. The Washington National Cathedral is preparing to reopen this Sunday for in-person services. The cathedral closed a few days before Christmas due to a spike in CCP virus cases. All cathedral services were moved online through the holiday season. Services at the cathedral will resume this Sunday. And that's all we have for you on today's Capitol Report. Thank you for joining us on NTD Television. I'm Steve Lance. Have a great weekend, and we'll be back Monday with all of the latest news from the Capitol.